Does your child struggle with big emotions anytime you call their name to come do something? Or maybe your kid tries ignoring you, or they're arguing back and telling you to wait a minute. Hi everyone, this skill of coming when you're called is so important. It's a huge life skill and it's one of the foundational pieces to helping children develop emotional regulation. I wanna show you what's happening inside your child's heart and give you six simple to put into place strategies that you can use with your children to develop cooperation and build more peace in family life. What's happening in the heart for your child is that they're having to make a choice. When they hear you call their name, they have to make a choice of whether or not they're going to cooperate or if they're going to keep doing what they want to do. They're making a choice at the conscience level of doing what's right or not doing what's right. This involves managing disappointment, uh, dealing with different expectations, accepting someone else's agenda. All of that involves managing emotions. For some kids who are arguing back with us, who refuse to come, who get angry, who act shocked or disappointed when we tell them to come and when they're called, what's happening at that level is they're struggling with going through a grieving process. Everyone goes through the grieving process when they lose a loved one or something important in their life. Think about all those steps. You've probably heard them before about shock and disappointment, anger, bargaining, denial. Eventually though, that cycle ends with acceptance. For some children, they're struggling with getting through that cycle. You see, when we tell them they need to come over here, they're in the middle of playing that video game or building with blocks or throwing a ball or, or dressing up their dolls or whatever it is. And now that has to stop. They're grieving the stopping of that activity. Even if it's just momentarily, for some kids, they're so emotionally invested in that activity that it truly is a grieving process. And they're having a hard time getting through that process in an efficient manner. Now, it's not wrong for your child to take longer to get through the grieving process any more than it's wrong for anybody to struggle with grief and to take long to get to acceptance. It's healthy for us to deal with our emotions as they are and to help handle them and manage them forward productively so we can get to that acceptance point. So it's not wrong for your child to take longer, but it is counterproductive now and in the future it will be counterproductive. So what we need to do is we need to help develop fluency in their hearts. We're not asking them to stuff the emotion. We're telling them you need to get quicker at processing that emotion and we can do some things to help you with that. Now if this idea of your child moving through a grief process whenever you're calling them at times is sort of opening up your eyes here and letting you see your child's reactions in a different light, I want you to hit that like button. That'll let me know that this video is helping you and it'll help other parents get to see this video because you're telling YouTube, hey, other parents should see this too. Think about it. They need to know how to handle instructions from you, instructions from teachers, coaches, other adults in their world. If there's a safety issue, we don't want to be debating you coming over here is a safety issue. You need to come, so there's a safety component involved here. As your child gets older and gets a job, they're going to have bosses who are going to expect them to be responsive to them. So this is a life skill we're developing, developing, <laughs> This is a life skill we're developing fluency in to help your child. Ultimately, though, this is a faith issue, too. You see, Jesus is going to call your child to do some things for his kingdom. And we want your child to get really good at hearing his or her name. So that way, when Jesus calls, they're ready to go. Think about Samuel in the Old Testament as a young boy in the temple. He's hearing his name called. Eli eventually tells him, I'm not calling you. You want to answer back. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the next time that Yahweh called Samuel's name, he said just that. And that began Samuel's entire ministry at a young age, well into his adulthood. So we want to get good at helping kids hear their names and coming when called. So let's look at these six different strategies. They're really simple things to put into place, but they're going to change life in the right way for you. The first one is to start getting close. Us parents, we're really good at screaming our kids' names from three rooms away, at yelling up the stairs for our kids to come. Some of us are experts at this, but it's not working. And our kid yells back down the stairs at us. It's just not working. You want to get close. You want to get to the room your child's at. If necessary, you want to go into the room and be within two or three feet. Some kids need us to be that close. Some of our kids need us to go right next to them and even put an arm around them. That's okay. 
we want to get close because close proximity raises the value of what you're saying. Think about it. Someone sends you a text message. Your boss sends you a text message or an email about getting something done. Okay, that goes somewhere in your list. Your boss calls you. That raises it. Your boss stops by your office and sits down and talks to you five, ten minutes about this same thing. That, the felt value of their message goes way up because of close proximity. We want to get close to our kids. That's the first thing we can do. The second thing we can do that goes right alongside of getting close is considering the timing. We want to, when we get close, when we're in the room, we see what our child's doing. We want to consider the timing and ask ourselves, do I want to interrupt what my child's doing right now to get them to do the thing that I need them to do? You know, taking out the garbage, cleaning up their room, putting away their homework, whatever it is. Look, they might be in the middle of reading a book to a sibling. Well, that's precious. Maybe I don't want to interrupt that. Maybe they're about to complete a puzzle or finish a challenging level on a video game. Maybe I let that go. Maybe they're about to finish their math homework and I can wait five minutes for that. So I'm considering the timing. There's other times where you're going to see them doing some of those same things and you're going to decide, no, I do want to interrupt this. I want them to get good at coming when they're called, even when they're doing that activity. You're going to make that decision. You're not asking your child, do you mind if I interrupt you right now? You're just making a decision here and then you're deciding and we're going to, are we going to proceed with interrupting here and, and doing the task we're going to do so we develop that level of hard work or are we going to wait a few minutes and let them finish that up? When you're first starting this out and helping your child develop fluency, this third strategy is really important. It's giving your kid a heads up whenever possible. It won't always be possible. There's times in family life where we just have to say our kid's name and get them to do something. And it wouldn't be healthy for our kids to always expect a heads up. But right now as we're developing this, I wanna use this strategy as frequently as possible. I wanna be able to walk over to my kid and say something like, hey, in a few minutes, I'm gonna come back and you're gonna have a task you're gonna to need to do. So you're gonna to have to stop playing that game for a few minutes and go do the thing I tell you to do. So get your heart ready, I'm coming back in a few minutes. Saying something like that helps them start that process a little bit earlier. And so that way you have a better chance when you come back and give them that task that they're gonna do it because they're further along in the process. So giving them a heads up, especially when we're practicing this as much as possible is really helpful. A fourth strategy you can use is only using your child's name. Let's say I want Jonathan to take the trash out. When I see Jonathan playing a game and I walk over to him and say, Jonathan, you need to take the trash out. Now Jonathan's heart, remember we're in their heart, is wrestling. Do I take the trash out or do I keep playing my game? I know which one I wanna do if I'm Jonathan, right? But if I just say, Jonathan, in the heart, the choice is between come when daddy calls me, keep playing my game. This, I, he still might choose to keep playing. We can't change that. But this is a harder choice for the heart to make because it's a choice between being responsive and cooperating, being responsible, having the sense of obligation to family, or continuing to do my thing and doing the wrong thing right now because I've been called. That's a lot harder choice for the conscience to make than between the, the garbage and <laughs> the activity I want to do. If you just say your kid's name until they put down the thing and give you their attention, you're going to see a whole lot more success and a lot more cooperation. And when they give you your attention, you can thank them and say, wow, thank you so much for turning and putting that down. I appreciate that. Now, let me tell you what I need you to do. It's a chance to build positivity into the relationship too. The fifth strategy you want to have in place is knowing how to say what you want to say once you have your kid's attention. Nothing can get more frustrating when you're at work and your boss gets your attention, but then delivers instructions in a way that's confusing, vague, you're unsure if this is something you have to do or if you have a choice, that gets really hard. We don't wanna do that to our kids too. We wanna to be real crystal clear on the instructions we're giving. We want our kids to know that we're talking, this is an instruction you need to do and then you wanna come back and check in with me. Getting good at giving instructions is an important parenting skill as well. And you can develop that skill by grabbing the free resource I've linked down below. It's five simple steps to get your kids to follow instructions better and it starts with you and how you deliver those instructions as well. Lots of families have found it helpful. You're gonna find it helpful too. So go ahead and grab that one as you're watching this video. And the sixth strategy you can put into place is lots of practice. It's not enough to talk to kids about this and say, hey, I want us to get good at doing this. We need to actually practice it. So we're gonna have a little team meeting with our kids and we're gonna say, hey, you know how I keep yelling for you to do things and, and we get into arguments and I'm yelling up the stairs. That's not really peaceful. 
It's really not working for our family. I want our family to be a place of peace, a place of cooperation. I'm sure you would like that too. So here's what we're going to do. See how I'm using lots of we pronouns here because this is a team thing. This is a family thing we're doing together. We're all on the same team here. This isn't about me task mastering you. This is about us learning how to work together. And so then we have to tell our kids, and we're gonna practice this a whole lot. And I can't wait to see what a great job you do. And as you go out and practice, you want to grab that free resource I linked down below. And if you're staying here on YouTube, check out some of the other videos that I have here just for you. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you real soon. Bye, everyone.